Hi, I'm Dr. Linda Schott. I am the Soil and Nutrient Management Extension Specialist for the University of Idaho, based in Twin Falls. Idaho ranks fourth in the nation for dairy production, and most of that dairy production occurs here in southern Idaho. The purpose of this video is to highlight ways that cropping systems management can help overcome nutrient management challenges that dairymen face here in southern Idaho. In addition to milk, dairy cows produce urine and feces. These byproducts are collected and they'll typically go through some sort of separation technology to help separate the liquid from the solid. Next, these byproducts, which are either manure, compost, or lagoon water, can be land applied. These byproducts are not waste products, even though we often refer to them as waste products they have a lot of value, specifically as fertilizer. They contain a lot of soil and plant essential nutrients, such as nitrogen, carbon, potassium, and phosphorus, as well as other micronutrients. However, these dairy byproducts don't necessarily contain these plant essential nutrients in the right ratio to go grow crops. For instance, when you apply enough compost or dairy manure to supply enough nitrogen to grow a crop like corn silage, you're over applying phosphorus and potassium. While not inherently dangerous, eventually this will, will or can lead to water quality impacts. However, if you apply these nutrients at a phosphorus or potassium rate, your crop will need more nitrogen to reach its full potential and have the highest yield. Next, we're going to hear from Marcia Niebling from Niebling Consulting about some challenges that dairymen face here in southern Idaho in regards to managing their dairy byproduct nutrients. I'm Marcia Niebling and uh, we've lived here in the valley for 28 years. Um, I started this business in 1998 as the nutrient management planning and the whole system was developing. and. Um, so since then I, I started out working in Idaho with dairies and since then I've expanded to uh, work also in uh, Washington and Oregon and um, it's been a very interesting work. The biggest challenge that I see is that um, they have to figure out a way to distribute their manure so that it helps with crop growth but doesn't hurt surface water, groundwater, and the air. And um, that's a big challenge, especially for nitrogen and phosphorus and salts. Um, just to keep those all where you want them is a challenge. Part of it is what they need as far as feed, and part of it is what they're comfortable with as far as, some people want to be out on the edge trying new things, and some people want to stick with tried and true. And uh, so a lot of it goes back to those two things, which, which way they, which side they want to kind of operate on as far as trying new things or not. Uh, a lot of people grow triticale. Most dairymen at some point or other grow triticale but with their corn, but uh, people are doing more other things now. I've had people lately saying, well, the chopping is an issue for the triticale, so I'm growing barley, and it's a little easier to manage. Or, um, you know, some people are doing sorghum sedan grass and things like that, so. We also went to talk with Ed Obadike with Obadike Dairy about how he is putting these innovative strategies into practice. He's moved away from a traditional alfalfa corn silage rotation into a more diverse one to help address his nutrient management challenges. I'm at Opadike in Mountain Home, Idaho. Uh, we um, have a dairy out here and milk about 2,500 cows. Uh, we have our replacements uh, on hand and uh, we uh, 
we're, we're, we're visiting today about uh, our nutrient management and our crop rotation. We do export most of our manure, like 90 some percent of it. And uh, it's kind of something that I enjoy doing because the, the farmers want to take it. Um, and um, um, if, if they want it, I, I don't want it here because I keep my numbers down and uh, someday if I have to put it here, I, I have that ability. Um, basically around here, um, we have very low organic matter in the soil, you know, so it doesn't hold water that well and it's very, very low, like in the 1% range. And uh, so they, they like to get the manure because um, uh, basically, yeah, there's, there's no minerals in, the, in there either, phosphorus, uh, you know, um, it's not, it doesn't hurt them at all. They, they need the phosphorus, they, they need the nitrogen. You know, it takes years in the soil to become fertilizer, but uh, the guys that are taking it are patient and they, they realize that, um, you know, they got this, this white dirt that's low in organic matter and it has no bottom under the pivot tires, you know, and uh, they, they all say that uh, by, by routinely applying manure, it kind of, uh, kind of helps some of those problems. So every single year we've, we've kind of been reevaluating um, be, because of the forage needs and, and the water issues. Um, I think, you know, we, we get kind of back to where we need to be. We'll probably, you will probably stick to rotating uh, two pivots of triticale and sedan grass and then uh, one pivot. Uh, we'd probably like to keep one in Italian ryegrass and one in corn. So some. Some, some kind of rotation. We don't want to keep the same thing going all the time. But uh, we don't really have a set rotation at this point. So, and you know, as far as, as phosphorus and nitrogen uptake, corn does not do a real good job. You know, the numbers that are in the book do not apply at all to what it actually does. And uh, sedan grass, it's, a, it's also a warm season grass, but you know, it comes in that time when the ground's warm and it's ready and it, it pulls nitrogen really well. And triticale, you know, all cold season grasses really, really pull nitrogen and phosphorus out of the ground. And when you can throw the Italian ryegrass into the mix, it, uh, it, it really uses up a lot of nitrogen. What we would do with it is, is you would uh, plant it in the spring and take five cuttings off of it. And then, um, it'll, uh, it'll like vernalize over the winter because it will not mature and, and throw a seed the first year but after frost then the next spring um, you cut it and you get a really nice big crop but you about a month before alfalfa but you got to get it before it matures and then once you get it off then uh, then you you'll strip till corn into that and that uh, that um, that works really well so you know the grass is there to kind of suppress the weeds keeps the ground loose, you know, and then also, you know, the uh, cool season grass, it really fixates the phosphorus for that corn. So that's a nice rotation too. But we, with the limited water, Italian ryegrass really likes water. With the limited water, we, we haven't grown any, but I, I anticipate growing some more, you know, next, next year. So it's, it's, it's a one year crop, year and a fifth crop and it will make 10 tons of dry matter in a season so it does compete with corn for for forage yield yeah uh, i don't want to be married to something for five years in case uh we we you know need to get rid of some 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 uh you know solid stack or or waste that we weren't planning on you know i i I like, uh, I like to be able to, uh, to grow other forages that, uh, wet forages that we can't, uh, we can't buy elsewhere. In addition to having a more diverse crop rotation, Obadike Dairy has also adopted new irrigation technologies to help not only reduce their pumping costs, but also allow them to apply lagoon water in a more efficient manner. In this field, and actually all of his other fields, Ed has converted his irrigation system into a drag drip system. And for this, the nozzles or tubing are 
dragged on the ground so that irrigation water loss is very minimal. However, the um, openers on these are so small that it's difficult to put lagoon, lagoon water through the system. So he's also incorporated these overhead sprinklers so that in the, especially in the winter, he's able to apply lagoon water to his growing crop. As it converted, as we'd heard about it, then, you know, we did not have the nozzles. It was just, they converted it directly to drip. And we grew corn out here and, you know, all the agronomists and, and everybody is like, you can't grow corn on, you know, 550, 600 gallons per minute on pivot. It'll never work, never work. And they kept coming out and, you know, they were kind of shocked all year. And it, it ended up being, you know, a great, great crop. So uh, we would generally will grow uh, two uh, triticale uh, crops over the winter. So uh, we uh, spread our lagoon water uh, in the fall and in the spring on those crops. And uh, that's how we get our lagoon empty. And uh, they, it takes up, uh, we double crop those uh, fields with sedan grass generally. So it takes up the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus that uh, we get put out on that. Dairy manure and compost are high value fertilizers with a lot of worth. They are not waste products. By properly managing them, they can really help improve soil health metrics by inc including more carbon in the system, improve infiltration, provide plant available nutrients, uh, reduce runoff, again, when properly managed. By critically thinking about their nutrient management and cropping rotations, dairymen like Ed Obadike are able to maximize their forage production while also maximizing their ability to apply lagoon water, dairy compost, and dairy manure in a way that prevents accumulation of soil nutrients like soil phosphorus and soil potassium that may have a negative impact on water quality and crop production.